Uh, thank you all for joining us today. This is uh, MCI's um, Lemonade Stand webinar series, which we started at the uh, way back at the beginning of COVID to capitalize on all of us being stuck at home and to uh, kind of provide, um, you know, just an opportunity for us to get together, uh, share information about the, the wonderful world of male contraception research and development, and to just, you know, give us an opportunity to get to know each other and collaborate and, uh, you know, just share updates on our work. So we are very lucky today. We have uh, three researchers from South America who are working on various um, male contraception projects. And they are going to each give us a presentation about their work followed by some Q&A. Um, just for you know, uh, general rules of the road, if you have a question, uh, please feel free to raise your hand in Zoom um, or you can type it in the chat box and I will read it out to our presenters. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted some, uh, some basic housekeeping from MCI. So we have um, our 2022 RFA is going to be coming out soon. So uh, thank you for your patience on that. And please be sure to sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye on our website as well as our social media um, channels for news on that. Uh, we are accepting applications for both our fellowships as well as our Tucker Award. Um, the Tucker Award is uh, $5, up to $5,000 in support for international students or professionals to travel to the U.S. for uh, career building opportunities. So um, please be sure to share that with your channels and uh, you know, let us know if you know of anyone who's interested in that. And then our ongoing training success grants, things like travel grants, now that we're having conferences again, they're, they're uh, open and, and available. So if there's any interest there, please um, either apply online or reach out to us with any questions. Um, and that's that's about it. Without further ado, we're going to uh, turn things over to the, the speakers. So today we have Mariano Buffone. Uh, he's a scientific researcher from the National Research Council of Argentina's Instituto de Bala, excuse me, Biologia y Medicina Experimental in Buenos Aires. Um, and I apologize for butchering that, Mariana. Uh, he's been working in the field of sperm physiology for over two decades, and his lab seeks to understand the complex process of mammalian sperm capacitation. Next, we'll have Patty Kwasniku. She is also from CONACET, IBYME CONACET in Buenos Aires. She's been working in the field of male contraception since 1984 and has been a leader in the field, serving with the WHO Task Force, Conrad, and other organizations. And last, we're going to hear from Eric Jose Romo de Silva, uh, Assistant Professor of Pharmacology in Department of Biophysics and Pharmacology at the Institute of Biosciences in Botucatu, Sao Paulo State, Brazil. Eric has experience in pharmacology, focusing in pharmacology, molecular biochemistry, experimental endocrinology, and reproductive biology. And he is a tireless mentor to young researchers interested in the field. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna turn it over first um, to Mariano to introduce, to introduce himself and give a presentation. Then we'll have some questions and we'll go on to Patty and then Eric. So Mariano, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this great opportunity to share our results. And thank you, MCI, for all the support that we are having to run this project. So basically, um, there is a need to, for a male contraceptive by means of hormonal and non-hormonal methods. And this is a very attractive alternative. Of course, this uh, contraceptive needs to be to fulfill certain requirements, like for example, needs to be safe, needs to be reversible, inexpensive, easy to use, and without major side effects. And of course, it does not have to affect uh, the libido. So the problem is that we don't have a, an effective form of contraception for men, and, so, and such uh, the burden falls largely on women. And uh, so far only condoms and, and vasectomy are the available choices right now. And the hormonal approaches to prevent, for example, sperm production uh, remain elusive. So the challenge is to, in our case, to develop a drug that blocks sperm function. And this is a particular challenge because um, sperm uh, do not divide, do not transcribe or translate. 
uh, they have a specialized organelles and are highly motile and also they are producing large numbers. So this really complicates uh, the strategy that we want to use. And a, ma a major barrier also is the lack of an effective high throughput uh, screening to test uh, sperm function. So I will start with uh, our goal is to tackle hyperactivation. It's a hallmark of sperm capacitation. Sperm during capacitation develop this uh, hyperactivated movement. Sperms are like move vigorously and they, they, they tend not to be progressing. And it's very important this type of movement for at least uh, three things in the female reproductive tract. One is to move through the viscous fluid of the, uh, within the ovidor, also to detach from the epithelium and also to cross or to penetrate the barriers that uh, surround the uh, ovulated oocytes. And a key player in, in this type of movement is a calcium channel called Katzberg, was discovered uh, almost two decades ago by, by David Clapham Group. Uh, it consists in four subunits, all of them form the, the pore. And when you knock out any of these subunits, you get completely sterility. And, and there is basically no fertilization. Uh, Katzberg is activated by, project, by, by alkalinization, strongly activated by alkalinization, both in mice and humans, and also by, by progesterone or other uh, esterols in, in, in humans. And it displays a very peculiar distribution along the principal piece. It's, it, it's, it forms basically four columns, uh, as, as you can see here in this beautiful work from uh, Xing Shu's lab. Um, and, but Casper channels are ideal contraceptive targets for, uh, for four uh, main reasons. One is the sperm specific channel. So it's only expressed in mammalian sperm. So the chances of having uh, non-desired side effects is minimum. Casper's are essential for fertilization. And if you knock out any of the four genes that encode the Casper, mice are completely sterile. And also we have uh, very strong evidence that Casper loss of functions in, in humans are, uh, are common in infertile patients. So this is, this is a very attractive target, but the problem is that Katzberg is probably the most complex ion channel now in nature. It, it, in addition to this uh, four subunits that forms the pore, it has at least six additional subunits that are important for its functions and also several associated prote proteins, uh, signaling proteins that form this Katzberg signaling complex. Mm -hmm. So the complex uh, structural organization of this channel uh, was, is, was a real problem to express this channel um, in a heterologous uh, system to study its regulation in vitro. And we normally, uh, Casper function is normally assessed only by patch clamp, but this is, this is a great technique, but it's impossible to use this technique to, to screen thousands of compounds. So our goal is, was to develop a high throughput method to screen drugs with the capacity to block Katzberg. And how we do that? Well, we used, uh, first I'm gonna explain how we, we test the Katzberg function and then how we take this, this approach and uh, in a high throughput screening method. So Katzberg is very selective for calcium, but when we collate calcium with EGTA, for example, it becomes permeable to sodium. So when we add EGTA, sodium can, uh, can go through the through Katzberg and produce a membrane, membrane potential depolarization. And this depolarization can be followed by increasing fluorescence using specific probes. As you can see here, for example, these are traces of fluorescence. When you add EGTA here in red, you, you observe an increase in fluorescence, fluorescence due to this depolarization caused by sodium. In contrast here in blue, when we add uh, a Katzberg inhibitor, this depolarization does not occur, right? So this is the principle that we are going to use to test Katzberg, but we're going to use it in flow cytometer. So to, to set up the conditions, we use Katzberg knockout sperm. So you can see here that this is the calcium, got the, the heterozygous displays and uh, high levels of, of calcium and this, this peak is completely lost in the cuts per knockout mice. And when we add this membrane potential indicator, DIX35, you can see that there are two populations 
one is depolarized sperm and the other one are hyperpolarized sperm. So when we add EGTA in the heterozygous, you can see that this population of hyperpolarized sperm disappear, is gone. But in cost, contrast, in cuts per knockout, when we add EGTA, this population doesn't change because Gatsper is not there, so sodium cannot enter the cell. So, but the way we observe this usually is by continuously monitoring the events in a flow cytometer. So here you have the disc free fluorescence. This is the population of high fluorescence here. And when we add EGTA, this population basically disappears. And in the Gatsper knockout, when we add EGTA, it doesn't occur. Okay, so this, uh, is, this is our, this is the, the way we are going to test if, if something is blocking Casper or not. And of course we can, we can plot how this fluorescence uh, uh, is moving in, in, in time. And you can see here in the Casper knockout, the fluorescence is very stable, but in the, in the wild type in the, or in the heterozygous in this case, it drops, okay? Now, how are we going to use this in a high throughput system? And we are going to use a novel technique, novel for us, for at least for, for uh, our field, which is called fluorescent cell barcoding using flow cytometry. So the idea here is that we use, um, I'm going to explain this in a very simple matrix of nine uh, positions. So we use two dyes. The first dyes we add in this direction in increasing concentration. So B has more concentration than A and C more concentration than B. And in the other direction, we have the second dye that is increasing in this direction. So, uh, and then we have the sperm. So as you can see here, each well will have a unique signature of fluorescence. For example, in this one, we have very low concentration of dye two and dye one. And on the, in contrast here in C, we're gonna have high concentration of dye two and dye one. So what we do then is we mix all these populations together and we run them through a flow cytometry. So we select the population of sperm cells based on, the, on, on these two parameters. And then because each population has a unique uh, fluorescent signature, we can separate them uh, in uh, doing the analysis. And for example, here we have very low fluorescence in this dye and in this dye, and we can basically very easily separate this population uh, among all the others. So what we do is to set up the conditions, we, we try a lot of uh, different concentration of one dye. I'm going to show you the example of one dye, but we did the same way with the other way, with the other dye. And you can see we try many, many, many concentrations they are all together, they, they overlap. And we, if we see, if we observe this using histograms, we can see that this um, basically populations uh, overlap. So we choose the ones that do not overlap, like here, okay? In this case, we choose three, and with the other one, we choose four. So we can be, uh, very easily separate the populations. And we, we, we combine uh, the two dyes, we get the, two, the three by four matrix in this case. And we, as you can see, we can separate the 12 populations because of the unique fluorescent signatures that each uh, well has. So here is the approach that we are using. Again, a very simple example with a, a nine well uh, matrix. We add nine different compounds here, one, two, three through, through nine, okay? Then we add the dyes in increasing concentration in this direction and in this direction. So each one has a unique signature. Then we add the cells in each, in each well. Then we add the membrane, membrane potential indicator and the propion iodide to select the uh, uh, live cells. We, we run them uh, yeah, through a flow cytometry and then we add EGTA and we run them again. After this, we select the sperm population from here, we select only live cells and we compare the different signatures. Each of, each of one was exposed to a different compound. And for example, here, this is an example, we have one uh, population what we separated from the others. And we can see here that after, um, before and after EGTA addition, EGTA addition, 
there, uh, there is no decrease in this population. Basically here we have a potential cancer inhibitor. In this case, this one was selected and we can see that in this case, we observe a depolarization because Katzper is not affected, okay? And now I show you a real example. So again, this is a simple matrix of, of three by four. In these two positions, we didn't add sperm. So as you can see, the, the populations are missing here. And in this case, we use, we added a Katzper inhibitor in this position, in this population. And here are the results. For example, we have no sperm in these two positions. In the other, the other compounds did not have an effect on Katzper, so you can see the depolarization in all the cases. But in this case, we have a Katzper inhibitor, there is no depolarization. So after this, we have we can plot this in a graph, and you can see all the compounds where did not affect Katzper significantly. And this is our control with our Katzper uh, inhibitor. The beauty of this is that we can, in this case, you see that in a single run, we can study on uh, about 12 compounds. But what we are doing is we are combining four, four compounds in each well. So basically, if we use a 96 well and we add four compounds in each well, and then we run this all together, we can test in using only eight tubes, about 400 uh, compounds and, and in a very, very, very fast because we only run eight tubes. And if we get a hit, for example, here in number three, because we have four compounds, we can then run them separately and, and see which one is the positive. So in, very, in, few, in a few minutes, we can run, or we can test about around 400 compounds using this approach. So this was uh, already set up and we are, we are um, testing uh, different uh, library of compounds. And our future direction is to identify novel compounds that inhibit Katzberg channels. We are proposing to test or to evaluate about uh, 18,000 compounds in, in, by combining different libraries. Then we are going to validate the selected compounds we are going to determine the toxicity and the IC50 for each compound. And we also going to collaborate with Dr. Alberto Darson in Mexico to, 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 to see by patch clamp if these are uh, suitable compounds to inhibit cat first. And we are going to also investigate the mechanism of action of these selective inhibitors. We, are, we wanted to understand if these are directly blocking the channel or if they are affecting other other signaling proteins that may affect also the channel. And the leading compounds uh, will be evaluated for their ability to also block human cats per pair, cats per press pair, human cats per prior to any large uh, scale or expensive human study. So I want to thank uh, all my whole lab for doing this, this research, in particular, uh, Guillermina Luque, Jamaica Schiavi, Martina, and Paula, who are doing most of, most of the work here. And a very special thank also to my collaborators in this project. And many, many thanks, a very a big gratitude to MCI for supporting this, this research. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Mariano. I, I think actually in the interest of time, why don't, we, uh, why don't we push all the questions to the end and we'll just let Patty and Eric present now and then um, We'll just save as much time as we can for questions at the end. So sorry about that. We're going to we'll change mid course here. So we'll uh, pass it over to Patty if you can, uh, okay. you can share your screen. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah. It's okay. Yes, thank you. Yes, this is great. Good. Okay, so thanks, Kevin, Logan, and, and all the MCI team uh, for giving us the opportunity to share with you uh, uh, our male contraceptive research in South America, and more specifically in Argentina. And as you know, 15% uh, of couples in reproductive age have fertility problems, indicating the need to develop new methods for both diagnosis and treatment of infertility. But at the same time, there is a 40% of unwanted pregnancy 
20% of which ends in abortion. And these numbers increase a lot significantly uh, for developing countries. So indicating the need of also developing new contraceptive methods uh, that meet the different needs and preferences of people in different parts of the world and at different stages of their reproductive lives. Now, which are the current contraceptive options? As you know, for women, we have several hormonal methods, the pill, the IUD, diaphragm, cervical caps, etc. But for men, we only have the condom and vasectomy, which cannot be considered really a contraceptive method because you have only 50% reversion and you never know in which percentage you will fall. Now, considering there is 60 million vasectomized men in the world, it is clear there is a niche in this field. The recent wide development of methods for male fertility regulation have been an important topic since the 70s in different international fora like WHO, NIH, Rockefeller Foundation, Conrad, and more recently, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and MCI. With the idea to emphasize the responsibility and promote the participation of men in family planning, meaning whether or not to have children, when, how many, and how space. Now, although this will involve uh, important cultural changes, the good news is that the level of acceptability is at least 50% among men and higher among women. Now, if we want men to use contraceptive methods, we need to give them more options. So why to develop male contraceptive methods? First, because family planning must be shared. It is not a woman issue, it is a couple issue. Second, because of health reasons. As you know, women use contraceptives for 35 years from menarche to menopause. Third, because it's a male right. We have to stop thinking that male contraception is just to help women and to begin thinking that it empowers men and the couple. And finally, because there is a niche according to the high percentage of vasectomized men in the world. Now, the development of main methods involve, of course, hormonal and non-hormonal approaches, which have the advantage to avoid the many side effects inherent to the use of hormones. And this is not a minor point because side effects are much less tolerated by men than by women. So the non-hormonal methods, which are at the more basic research level, involves uh, three uh, interference at three uh, different levels, mainly these three that I will show you. Production in the testis, that is spermatogenesis, interference with the release of a sperm through the vas deferens during ejaculation, or interference with the maturation process that occurs in the epididymis, this organ uh, shown here in yellow. And this is based on the fact that uh, sperm that leave the testes are immotile and unable to fertilize the egg, requiring to undergo a maturation process that occurs while sperm are passing through the epididymis to acquire the fertilizing ability. And this occurs mainly as a consequence of the association of epididymal proteins to the sperm plasma membrane. So the epididymis is considered an excellent contraceptive target because there will be no interference with the sperm or hormone production, important critical for uh, libido, but a specific uh, interference uh, with the acquisition of a sperm fertilizing ability. And the idea of having an ejaculate without the sperm fertilizing ability is uh, represents a safe, attractive, and promising approach. The reason why epididymal proteins become very good targets for fertility regulation. Based on this, the aims of our lab have been to study the role of epididymal proteins in sperm maturation and fertilization, and also to explore their potential uh, use uh, for fertility regulation. And we have been, been doing this uh, using a group of proteins called CRIS for cysteine-enriched secretory proteins that contain 16 conserved cysteines, 10 of which are located in the C-terminal region of the molecule called CRD for cysteine-rich domain, and which has ion channel regulatory activity. And the remaining 16 are in the N-terminal domain called PR1. This is a widely distributed and evolutionary conserved family uh, as just by the fact that they are members not only in mammals, but in many other individuals, indicating these proteins must play important functional roles. In mammals, four proteins have been described, uh, mostly in the male reproductive tract, and two of them of epididymal origin, and both uh, highly abundant within the epididymal lumen. 
So uh, Prince Wang was uh, the first identified member of this family and was described by uh, the group of Cameo Blaquer in Argentina. Uh, it's a glycoprotein uh, that associates with the sperm surface, both the head and the tail during epididymal maturation, and uh, which participates in these two stages of fertilization, sperm zona pellucida binding and gamete fusion through its binding to complementary sites localized in the zona and in the plasma membrane of the egg. And interestingly, there is a human freeze protein also synthesized in the epididymis and with the uh, same functional roles that the rodent counterpart, binding through complementary sites in the zona and the plasma membrane of the human egg. Now, a structural functional studies using the entire uh, recombinant uh, PRIS1 protein from rodents, as well as recombinant fragments and synthetic peptides, revealed that the ability of PRIS1 to bind to the plasma membrane of the egg and participate in fusion resides in a very small region of the molecule of only 12 amino acids located in the PR1 domain and which corresponds to one of the two signature motifs of the whole PRIS family. This uh, uh, represents the two domains of the protein. And here an image showing the location of the signature two and its accessibility. Now, in addition to the role of epidemic markers one in gamete fusion through ligand receptor interactions, uh, recent results obtained in our lab uh, using single, double, and multiple knockouts for CRISPR proteins reveal that CRISPR 4 plays a key role in gamete fusion, becoming another good target for contraception. And interestingly, in this regard, a human CRISP1 uh, is considered the equivalent to the combination of uh, CRISP1 and CRISP4 uh, in rodents, indicating the potential clinical implications of our studies in rodents. So um, besides the role of uh, CRISP1 and CRISP4 in gamete fusion, uh, results uh, obtained in our lab uh, several years ago in 2015 uh, revealed that CRISP1 acts also as a novel CATSPR regulator. As Mariano showed before, uh, CATSPR is the main mammalian sperm calcium uh, channel uh, located in the tail, composed of several uh, subunits, and essential for the development of hyperactivation and for male fertility, as judged by the fact that CATSPR knockout uh, sperm cannot hyperactivate, and that is the reason why the animals are infertile. So uh, electrophysiological studies using patch clam in collaboration with Alberto Darson um, show that CRIS-1 has the ability to inhibit CATSPR. And although there are several activators of the channel, this uh, would become the first inhibitor of CATSPR. So uh, based on this, the rationale of, uh, and goals of our lab is that the identification of compounds that interfere with the roles of CRIS proteins in gamete fusion and or cats per activity will affect fertilization and thus fertility representing an effective, safe and attractive male contraceptive approach. So regarding the role of CRISP1 in gamete fusion, we are looking uh, for compounds that could uh, interact with the signature two in CRISP1, blocking the interaction of the sperm CRISP1 with the egg and inhibiting gamete fusion. While uh, in the role of CRISP1 as a physiological cats per inhibitor, we propose uh, to identify a compound that mimic or strengthen the binding of CRIS-1 to cat sperm by interacting with the same binding site, but with a higher affinity and leading to an irreversible inhibition uh, of hyperactivation and that therefore to a, a male contraceptive approach. But of course, a, a compound like this could also inhibit cat sperm in the female, leading to a female contraceptive. So uh, what we are doing right now is uh, we are working on the identification of compounds that interfere with these functional roles of CRIS-1 with the support of MCI. And what we are doing basically is to develop a high throughput screening assay called alpha screen that senses the interaction between two labeled molecules. It's a proximity assay. In our case, the two molecules are a recombinant CRIS-1 carrying the signature 2 and an antibody against the signature 2. So these two uh, molecules are coupled to donor and acceptor beads. And if there is an interaction between them, there will be a signal uh, that can be detected by a plate reader. And this can be used uh, for a screening of a compound library with the idea 
that those compounds that bind to the signature two will interfere with the signal becoming potential candidates to block gamete fusion and fertility. And we propose the same uh, assay uh, for the uh, measuring or identifying compounds that inhibit, inhibit the CATSPR inhibitor activity. And what uh, we are proposing is instead of using the anti-signature two antibody to use uh, a cat sperm subunit, subunit that binds to PRISC1. So we believe in conclusion that these studies uh, will provide interesting preclinical information that will contribute to the identification of new and safe targets for non-hormonal male contraception. And I'd like to uh, finish by thanking all the people uh, in the lab present and in the past that worked in this project our national and international collaborators, and of course, the organizations and agencies that support our work. Thanks for your attention. Awesome, thank you so much, Betty. That was fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll uh, move on. To, yep, sorry? Good. <laughs> yeah. um, and Eric, we'll turn it over to you and then we'll open it up to uh, the audience for some Q&A. Can you hear me? Oh, yep, there we are. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, right, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, uh, for the nice introduction. And um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, Mariano and Patricia already gave a very nice introduction on why we need new male contraceptives. So I can jump into directly into the topic of my talk, which is EPIN. That stands for EPIN is uh, Epididymal Protease Inhibitor. It is a cysteine secretory rich, uh, 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 cysteine rich uh, secretory protein that contains two protease inhibitor domains, a WFDC domain in its N terminal region and the Kunitz type domain in its C terminal region. Epin uh, is highly enriched in, hum in humans in the, male, in the human male reproductive tract, particularly in the testis as a product of Sertoli cells and germ cells and in the epididymis as a product of epithelial cells. And it's found on sperm head and flagellum. The physiological re relevance of epin lies in its ability to regulate sperm motility. So we know that after ejaculation, uh, spermatozoa are trapped in a gelatinous-like mass known as the semen coagulum that contains the seminal plasma protein, seminogelin-1, as its major component. So seminogelin-1, or SMG1, binds epin on sperm surface, thus leading to the inhibition of sperm motility. It's only when the serine protein leading to the liquefaction of coagulum so that spermatozoa acquire activated motility and is able to move, are able to move forward to the upper regions of the male, female reproductive tract towards the, the site of fertilization. So, uh, Copcat nature is always a great strategy for developing novel therapeutic case with epin as a male contraceptive candidate. Since we know that epin acts as a docking site for protein-protein interactions uh, on sperm surface that leads to the inhibition of sperm motility, then the rationale is to search for epin ligands that could substitute for seminogelin. So uh, I was just telling that uh, copcat nature is, is always a great strategy for developing novel therapeutics. And th this is no different case with epin. As um, uh, we know that epin acts as a docking site for protein-protein interactions on the surface of spermatozoa uh, that leads to the inhibition of sperm motility. Then it's just a matter of finding epin ligands that could substitute for uh, seminogelin one and keep sperm motility inhibited beyond the semen liquefaction does inhibit its sperm function. Uh, this strategy is, is feasible uh, since uh, studies by Professor Michael Rand uh, show that anti-epin antibodies and also epin is more organic ligands such as the experimental compounds B4 and the PO55 are able to bind epin and in inhibit sperm motility and therefore providing a potential male contraceptive effect. So in this area of research, there are still several basic research challenges that uh, sh uh, should be overcome to uh, contribute to move EPIN uh, forward as a male contraceptive candidate. For instance, despite the ability of the, the, the ability of EPIN experimental ligands 
we still know very little about epin roles on male fertility and its mechanism of action in the regulation of sperm function. Uh, to address this gap in knowledge, we believe that developing novel animal models could shed new light into this uh, 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 gap of knowledge, thus providing information Eric. on epping. Yes? Eric, sorry. Yes. Sir. You're not sharing the screen. Green. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It's just so embarrassing. Hold on a second. No, no worries at all, Eric. No worries. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you. Yes, okay, great. Uh, so uh, I was just telling that uh, these animal models could also be used as tools for the uh, investigation of safety and efficacy of these epin experimental ligands in preclinical trials uh, as male contraceptives. So this is a topic that we have been addressing in our laboratory uh, by investigating the roles of um, epin as a modulator of sperm function using the mouse as an experimental model. But then why we chose uh, uh, mice? Uh, well, number one, uh, it, it, uh, mouse epin is highly identical, uh, highly conserved uh, to, in comparison to human epin. They are uh, approximately 65% identical in their primary sequence and over 80% similar. More importantly, we observe that uh, a, a sequence that contains 10 amino acid residues that is flanked uh, they are flanked by two aromatic residues in human epin C terminal domain that we have previously shown that it's important for the interaction of seminogelin and also for the binding of the experimental compound EPO55, as I show here in uh, a, a molecular docking studies that we recently performed using the compound. We can see that this sequence is very important for uh, epin interactions with protein, other protein uh, binding partners. Uh, in experimental compounds as well. This sequence is 100% identical in mouse. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, we also observed that mouse expression profile is very similar to humans, being highly expressed in, in the male reproductive tract, uh, uh, particularly in the testes and the epididymis, as I show here in this PCR panel, and also in this uh, immunohistochemistry, and it's found on sperm head and flagellum. Uh, interesting, we observed that uh, the abundance of epin increases as spermatozoa mature in the epididymis. So based on that, we established the, uh, uh, the working hypothesis that the function of epin on the modulation of sperm motility is evolutionarily conserved between mouse and human. To test this hypothesis, we established two conditions that uh, epin uh, uh, Inter uh, interacts with seminal plasma proteins in mouse spermatozoa in a similar manner to humans, and also epin plays a role in the uh, regulation of mouse sperm motility. So to address the first uh, condition, what we did was to isolate mouse spermatozoa from the uh, uh, epididymis and incubate them with the seminal vesicle fluid. So that mimics the scenario where the spermatozoa meet seminal plasma proteins in the ejaculate. And then we process these samples for immunoprecipitation assays using the anti-NEPIN antibodies and search for uh, uh, co-immunoprecipitated proteins. We observed that among the co-immunoprecipitated proteins, uh, we found the seminal vesicle secretory protein uh, uh, SVS2. As I show here, the sequence uh, corresponding to SVS2 in red that were detected by, the, by mass spectrometry. And we, we are also able to uh, uh, detect the 45 kilodalton band corresponding to SVS2 in these immunoprecipitated samples when we probe them with the anti-SVS2 antibody. Well, uh, as an overview, we know that uh, seminogelin 1 and SVS2 are members of the REST family. REST stands for Rapidly Evolving Seminal Vesicle Transcribed. Uh, they are the major uh, proteins in seminal plasma from humans and mice. And as a matter of fact, SVS2 is the hortolog to human, uh, the mouse hortolog to human seminogelin one. Uh, uh, they bind both, bind spermatozoa and are able to regulate sperm uh, function. Uh, their encoded genes are located in hortolog, in a hortolog gene cluster, along with other rest uh, proteins. So what we did next was to further investigate whether uh, epin and SPS2 interact. 
So we initially performed a bioinformatic analysis using the string platform. And we showed that epin is part of a large uh, protein, uh, protein complex, uh, along with other members of the SVS2 family via a direct interaction with SVS2. This was consistent with the observation that when we immunoprecipitated uh, uh, SVS2 from spermatozoa previously incubated with the seminal vesicle fluid, we are able to detect epin, as I show here, the band corresponding to epin in the, uh, uh, when the, we probe the samples with the anti-epin antibody. And also we observed that epin and SVS2 co-localized when we incubated spermatozoa with the seminal vesicle fluid, thus indicating a co-localization with um, uh, the uh, native SVS2, but also with recombinant SVS2 uh, 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 as well. Uh, so it still we didn't we don't we did not have any bona fide evidence that these proteins in fact bind. So what we did next was to employ uh, a bit-based uh, protein-protein interaction approach based on the alpha screen assay that uh, Patricia just show you all the show us all the the, the the principles of the assay in which we uh, uh, conjugated recombinant SVS2 to one bead and recombinant mouse epin to the other bead. And we evaluated their interaction. And we showed, in fact, they show, they display a very nice interaction as I can just show you here with this high uh, alpha signal that was actually highly stable. They, the interaction was, uh, was also saturable when we titrated SVS2 or epping in the presence of a constant concentration of the binding partner, uh, we see uh, this uh, concentration response curve. Interesting was the fact that when we substitute SVS2 with recombinant seminal gel in one, we also observed a very nice uh, concentration uh, response curve with a very nice binding, demonstrating that uh, the binding sites in epping that interacts with seminal gel in one are conserved in mouse. Um, so, uh, showing that uh, we uh, uh, provided experimental evidence that, in fact, epping interacts with seminal plasma proteins in mouse spermatozoa, we went ahead and checked whether it's involved in the regulation of mouse permotility. And to address this topic, we raised the following question. Do epping ligands inhibit mouse permotility? To answer that question, we applied uh, an, an strategy in which we use different anti-epping antibodies. Uh, that are able to detect uh, different sequences in the protein in both its N-terminal domain and C-terminal domain. I call your attention to the antibody S21C here, shown in red. It targets uh, a sequence that spans that 10 amino acid residue that I told before that was important for seminogel in one binding. Uh, and it was shown to inhibit the uh, motility in, uh, uh, of human sperm motility. So we initially showed that all antibodies recognize mouse epin by Western blood and Western blood and immunofluorescence. And then for the sake of time, I'm just, just going to show you the uh, data with the S21C antibody because it provided the highest levels of inhibition of sperm motility. So using whole IgG uh, antibody and also its FAB fragment, we observed that there was some mild effect on total motility but a 50% reduction on progressive motility and almost 70% reduction on hyperactivated motility. This effect on motility was consistent with the observation that when we uh, took spermatozoa previously incubated with the antibody and used them in IVF, in the in vitro fertilization experiment, we observed a 30% reduction in the IVF, IVF rates in comparison to the IgG control. So finally, what we did next was to evaluate whether SVS2 could provide similar outcomes uh, uh, in comparison to the S21, S21C antibody in the regulation of sper mouse sperm motility. And in fact, it, that was what we observed. Uh, we did not see any particular striking effect on total motility, but a very nice concentration response effect on progressive motility uh, and an increase in slow motility and also an inhibition on hyperactivated motility which show that both ligands, uh, in fact, uh, uh, in provide a similar outcomes on sperm motility. This is actually a still a work in progress. We are currently investigating whether this effect of SVS2 is mediated by epin binding on sperm surface. Well, as a conclusion, uh, epin acts as a docking site for protein-protein interaction networks with seminal plasma proteins, implicating in, sperm in the modulation of sperm function in both 
mice and humans. And we are currently investigating whether uh, 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 the pattern of interaction between epin and SPS2, uh, mouse epin and SPS2, and its impact on the regulation of mouse sperm function and male fertility. Uh, finally, our results demonstrate that the mouse is a suitable experimental model for translational studies on epin, as well as for the preclinical investigation of experimental epin ligands as male contraceptives. Uh, I, I want to thank all my students, especially Noemia, Alexandre, Juliana, Alan, Tamiris, who were directly involved in this work, the, uh, Elio uh, for his technical support, all my collaborators, and the uh, financial support of funding agents. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I <laughs> overdo the time, and I'm sorry about me, uh, getting down my connection here. Thank you very much, Kevin. Not an issue at all, Eric, your sorry enthusiasm comes through wonderfully always. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you also to Mariano and Patty for your wonderful presentations. So we have about 10 minutes left. So um, we're gonna open it up to questions. If anyone uh, has any, feel free to jump in or if you want, you can just either raise your hand or um, add your, your question to the chat. So I guess I will get things started though by asking, you know, it's it's great that we have, you know, three researchers from South America. You know, we we tend to be focused on our own context as we're, we're thinking about, um, you know, all the different things that impact development uh, realities. So is there anything, could you each speak to, I guess, are there any, any cultural considerations that influence or impact your work or your, your perception of uh, accept, acceptability of these methods when they are available on the market in uh, Argentina and Brazil? And I'll just let anyone, uh, you know, we'll start with you, Patty. How about you go first? <laughs> um, well, I, is it possible to share a screen uh, again? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, stop sharing there and go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see, one minute, um, share screen. Okay, because I, I had a slide that perhaps can help a little bit. Um, well, um, the situation in, in, in Argentina, at least in, in I, I don't know in, in, in other countries, but um, in Argentina, um, we, in 2002, um, um, there was a, a law, the National Program on Sexual Health and Re Responsible Appropriation, that um, through which the National Ministry of Health guarantee 100% free provision of contraceptive methods within the public and the private health system. So this is really good. Uh, and in 2006, uh, we have a law that allows uh, sterilization. Uh, before that, it was forbidden. It allows tubal and vas deferens ligation vasectomy and guarantees also free surgeries for people older than 16. But although we have good policies and support regarding the use uh, of contraception in, in our country, there is little education or, or dissemination of the information uh, about contraception in general and, and nothing at all on male contraception. And, and, and whereas reproductive biology is a very important area of research in, in our country and is a long tradition, male contraception is really not on the radar. Uh, there is an, an Argentine Medical Association of Contraception created in 1999, but uh, if you go to the website, uh, there is very little information on male contraception. Everything is female contraception. Um, and well, the situation is also very difficult in funding because there are no special organisms or agencies supporting contraception in our country. Now it is possible to apply to a more general grant announcements to carry out basic research in the field of reproduction. And more recently, uh, supporting translation research the, the, within selected strategy areas. But in general, contraception is not a high priority area uh, for funding. Uh, and not only from a cultural perspective that I will go to that point, and also because Argentina has no population problems. We are only 44 million in a very extensive country. Um, regarding the cultural issues, well, of course, religion is one of an, an, important, an, an important aspect and, and issue. 
In Argentina, there is freedom of cult uh, guaranteed by the national constitution, but the Catholic Church has legal status and it's uh, supported by the state. So that shows a, a strong influence. And I think that this, um, this strong influence is all over Latin America. Um, it is not our official religion, but for example, the president had to be Catholic till 1994 and, and it's just uh, changed recently. And the Catholic Church is against artificial contraceptive methods and approves only natural methods of contraception, mainly abstinence from sex during the woman's fertile period. So, uh, well, in some way, I'm, I'm thinking also that uh, the leader of the church is the, the Pope uh, from Argentina. You, you see that uh, our country is really very uh, influenced by, by this aspect. Um, and he reminded recently people that there are many avenues that are permitted of natural family planning. Uh, in fact, we, we try to use fertility regulation instead of contraception just because uh, to, 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 as a way to manage this, uh, this controversial issue. So cultural issues uh, also involve the machismo, uh, which exists around uh, all the world, of course. Uh, but had been traditionally very strong in Latin American culture, and which fortunately has been changing in the past uh, years thanks to a strong feminist uh, campaigns. And lastly, the preferences are different also in, in our countries. In Argentina, for example, the pill is the most popular contraceptive method, and, and in US, uh, it is shared between the female sterilization and the pill, and in Canada, it's vasectomy, for example. So it is clear that North America and South America is different. Um, so, well, I think that uh, that regarding cultural issues in our country. Fantastic. Mariana, would you like to add anything about Argentina or uh, Eric about Brazil? No, no, I think, I think Patty did a great summary of what's going on in Argentina. Awesome <laughs> summary. Uh, I want to add that uh, we don't have special calls for grants. Uh, grant application for male contraceptive. That's that's very important. Um, like in the US that you have a special program at the NIH or the male contraceptive initiative. And my personal perception of here in Argentina is that people think that the problem is solved. So we have condoms. Why do you want to research on that, right? It's the same perception that sometimes have about reproductive biology. The problem is solved. You, we have ICSI, we have IVF. And Instead, when you when when they think about cancer, they think you can die of cancer. So, the the, the perception is that this problem is more or less solved. So nobody really think about the importance of uh, having a male contraceptive. So, uh, Kevin, uh, here in Brazil, uh, it's a very similar scenario than uh, Patrice and Mariano. Uh, described uh, as about Argentina. So we we don't have. Uh, 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 funding program directly and towards male contraceptive research. So for instance, I compete my grants with everybody from pharmacology field. It doesn't matter which, which area, uh, but um, the government, the, 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 there are laws that uh, uh, contraceptive methods are freely available in the pub public health system. However, there's very little education, very little campaigns about that. Um, we could see um, uh, there's just the case of the condoms, but more directed towards the uh, a prevention of uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease, not from the contraceptive point of view. So mm -hmm. there is a lack of education. It's, uh, I believe it's a cultural thing. I'm not sure about that, but I can say that with our uh, current right wing administration, the situation got a little bit worse complicated about that because uh, contraception is not at all a topic that they want to discuss in the government, uh, in federal government area. Uh, on the other hand, I can say that this is a topic that gets into people my, people's mind in Brazil. We just had the experience of our uh, study being um, uh, uh, on the news, and I got lots of calls, and, and there, there was a, a, a um, uh, I, I can say a uh, very awareness of the, the, the scenario and all the comments that we could see were that, okay, we really need that. We need, need to move that forward. We really need novel contraceptive methods, especially male ones. So I can see that in Brazil, there is this culture, but what we need to do is actually to 
strength awareness and education, especially in the school levels and on teenagers. Yes. That's tremendous. I, I saw Margaret, you had had your hand up. Um, we're almost at time, but would you like to, uh, to ask your question? Yeah, I was going to ask uh, about um, this very interesting tour through basic science, but what of uh, these uh, researchers each anticipate, if at all, about actual dosage methods in human use? Uh, do these various um, strategies um, come with restrictions about what's possible or make new avenues possible? It's a question for each one. Yeah. Maybe this is premature. Yeah, Science. I think it's too premature, but it's very interesting. And I think we are going in that direction, but it's, we, in our case, we need to first have a good, good targets or good hits yeah. to, to do research on them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. We, we are all in, in preclinical stages. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so uh, we are, we are uh, still far from, you know, this, this um, the development of a method like this is very, very, very long, long process. No, no, I understand. Uh, right. and, yeah, but, it's very long. But, uh, you know, the hormonal methods uh, had began to be developed 40 years ago, and uh, still there is nothing over the counter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we know it's, it's, it's complicated, but if you don't start and if you don't try, for sure you will have nothing. So uh, yes. we need to continue doing this and, and probably uh, in some years we will have, but it's difficult to imagine exactly the way it will right. be. Uh, although it's, yep, sorry. Yes. Although, just, although it's, it's really hard to say, uh, anticipate things that of course should be available in the future but there is one advantage here with these strategies is that if it works they work we could have a method that has low latency period in other words it's acts quite fast and it's quickly reversible it's different than the hormonal methods for men that they inhibit spermatogenesis so it takes a month to achieve a low in a low sperm count so in this case, in, with these strategies, although of course we are all in the preclinical uh, 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 research, in my case, it's even more basic research because we are searching for the basic biolo biology for, of our target. But we can say that we envision something that when it works, it will be really, really uh, um, uh, um, versatile and on demand. So this is very important, I believe, from the, from the uh, market scenario, because female contraceptives, they work really fast. The first cycle, then there's no ovulation anymore. So if we have something that is similar for male with high levels of efficacy and safety, that's gonna be so, so great, yes. Very interesting, thank you. That's absolutely what we're, what we're working towards, the gold standard, right? Uh, high efficacy and high uh, safety. Um, so thank you all very much. I know we're a little bit over time, but I appreciate you all staying on and, and asking your questions. Um, really huge thanks to Patty, Mariano, and Eric for taking the time to present your work to us. It's all fascinating and, and awesome to know that there's such good work going out, uh, going on out there in the world. Um, just some practical stuff. We're going to have this, uh, the video of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel. We have a playlist of all of our previous Lemonade Sand webinars. So please go there and check out those. Um, we will add all of you to uh, future distribution lists for our next Lemonade Stand. So if you're interested in registering for that, that'd be great. Um, and please, you know, if you have any questions, you're thinking about anything related to male contraception, um, both generally or specifically for these researchers, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'll certainly try and answer whatever questions you have or put you in connection with people. And uh, thank you all very, very much for, uh, for your time and, and for just your consideration of male contraception. So we'll, uh, we'll be in, in touch with future opportunities, future uh, lemonade stands, and uh, we'll see you then. All right, so thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you for... Uh, organizing this meeting and for the permanent support. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for everything. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.